Hello, I'm Charles White, a director at McEnroy and Wood. The impact and risks that climate change poses to all our lives is beyond reasonable doubt. It is increasingly one of the most important factors that influences investment thinking at McEnroy and Wood as we try to determine the industries and companies that will be most at risk and those that are set to benefit from the energy transition. In informing investment policy, we have always engaged extensively to help inform our position on difficult and complicated issues such as climate change. For instance, our continued holding of investments in the oil and gas industry in client portfolios has been informed by wide-ranging engagement. Some of you may have joined our webinar with Professor Miles Allen in May 2021, in which he outlined the critical role oil and gas companies will have in delivering energy transition, particularly with regard to the development of carbon capture and storage. Reducing climate risk will be challenging and require investment in a range of industries and technologies. These include mining and metals, a sector which also faces increasing investor scrutiny on environmental, social and governance grounds. Our investment approach in this area has also has been supported by broad engagement, including with Wood Mackenzie, a leading energy and resources consultancy. I'm delighted to introduce a recording of a recent talk by Julian Kettle, Vice Chair of Wood Mackenzie's Metals and Mining Division. In the talk, Julian highlights the critical reliance on the metals and mining sector in achieving energy transition and ultimately delivering net zero targets. The simple case he makes is that the energy transition starts and ends with metals. I hope you enjoy and find his talk informative. Firstly, um, it's great to be here and, and thank, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your evenings to listen to some thoughts that I have. Despite my youthful look, um, I've been doing this for 35 years and for the first time, I think, in that 35-year career, the pathway forward is pretty clear. Uh, and it, it was mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the energy transition, the low-carbon world, I think is a given. The genie is out of the bottle. But what I think is, is severely lacking, and this goes all the way from the public through to policymakers, is a lack of understanding around the challenges of delivering the metals for the energy transition. I mean, much to my chagrin, I, I tried to start a hashtag, hashtag no metals, no transition. And my kids said to me, Dad, you're never going to trend. And they were right. <laughs> but it's actually true. You know, without metals, you, there will be no transition. Um, if you want to generate, transmit, store or use low carbon energy, you cannot do it without metals, an unbelievably large amount of metals. The other thing I should say is that I wouldn't want any of you to go away thinking that I'm negative on the mining sector. I'm negative on our ability to achieve Paris climate goals. And the reason I, uh, we, I, I'm negative on the ability to achieve Paris climate goals is because we don't have the policy in place. And it's ultimately policy and society that will drive all of these things. So what I'll try and do, you, you'll find that classic Wood Mac presentation, um, it's very data rich. I'll try and navigate through that and we, and with, with some key takeaways, but, but obviously you'll get a copy of the slides if you want to. Uh, peruse them. I'm sure there'll be a great antidote to insomnia at some point. Just a little bit about Wood Mackenzie, the shameless plug, why we're built for the energy transition. The reason we're built for the energy transition, this is Wood Mackenzie, is because we cover all sectors relating to that energy transition. Be that upstream, oil, gas, pan renewables, um, battery raw materials, hydrogen, the hydrogen economy, all the way through to, to, to EVs and EV forecasts, metals and mining. We bring that all together in a very holistic way. You'll have heard um, commentators talk about, and, and myself talk about, Paris Climate Accords, the one and a half degree world, limiting um, the, global, the average global temperature increase uh, from pre-industrial levels, the debate as to what's pre-industrial, it's a long, long time ago. Um, to one and a half degrees. Now, various organizations produce their own pathway to deliver that one and a half degree world. 
through our analysis of all parts of the, uh, of, of the value chain and the different sectors, we pull the levers in a very integrated way to deliver that. And we think we do it quite well. So our one and a half degree um, outcome delivers the same outcome as, for example, the IEA SDS, Sustainable Development Scenario. So they are equivalent, we just achieve it in different ways. So we think we have better knowledge of certain parts of the value chain. We certainly have detailed knowledge of uh, metals and mining. So that's the shameless plug for Wood Mackenzie. First off, I should say that Wood Mackenzie's base case is that we don't achieve the one and a half degree pathway. Why? Because we don't have the policy in place. So we have what we call our ETO, Energy Transition Outlook. Wood Mackenzie loves acronyms, by the way. I'll try and spell them all out. But ETO, our base case uh, view of the world. Um, and, and what I've done is I've just mapped out, the, and, and hopefully you can see some of these sides are a bit, a, a bit light. You can see which, which mined commodities um, benefit from Wood Mackenzie's base case growth. And, and you'll also notice I'm talking about the time period to 2030. Why am I not focusing on 2040 or 2050? The reason for that is that this is the next investment cycle, particularly for the mining sector. The miners aren't really thinking about the investment cycle for 2040 and 2050. And of course, a lot can change, as we know um, all too well with, with, with recent events. So um, broadly speaking, the, the new energy metals, as they're often called, um, Quite interesting, nickel is often included as, as, as an energy metal, and yet the vast majority of demand for nickel isn't derived from its use in batteries, it's derived from its use in stainless steel. And that will be the case all the way through to beyond 2030, so we shouldn't forget that. Uh, but nickel, lithium, uh, cobalt in particular, um, there's a heavy focus on them, uh, and, and we, are, we are likely to see uh, strong double-digit growth rates. So that's the right-hand graphic here, looking at the growth rates. You then have what you might call the traditional base metals. They're not classified as energy transition metals, but they absolutely are. And I'll give you an example of that. If you want to transmit energy, electricity, you have two options. One's aluminium, the other one's copper. If you are going to electrify the world, it'll come as no surprise, you need vast quantities of copper and aluminium to actually transmit the energy. If you're generating renewable green energy, that needs to be transmitted through wires. And there's only two options. So they are um, true energy transition metals, in my humble opinion. You then have some, um, some, some, some other interesting metals, rare earths. I won't even try and pronounce the names of the rare earths because I can't, they're quite complicated. But we need rare earths for a permanent magnet motors in particular. And Whilst they are called rare earths, they're not actually rare, they're just difficult to extract and they're in combination. Um, so energy transition and base metals will be growing at varying rates, but even under our two and a half degree scenario, they will be growing. So in the, the two left-hand graphics, we're showing you the absolute increase in demand over the next eight years to, to, to 2030. You then have the, the, the bulk commodities, coal, iron ore, and steel. And we have one part of steel growing quite rapidly. That's EAF, another acronym, electric arc furnaces, um, which is pre predominantly produced um, through the use of, of scrap, the melting of scrap. Um, that will grow quite strongly, whereas hot metal blast furnace production will contract over the next 10 years. What that means is that iron ore, it, seaborne iron ore, and those of you that, 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 that look even at a superficial level at, at major mining companies, you will know that some of the major multi-commodity mining companies have a huge exposure to iron ore. So Rio Tinto, BHP, Vale in particular. Seaborne iron ore will actually decline over the period. The reason for that is because of a growth in scrap supply and blast furnace production. For coal, now, I, I, I did say to, 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 to some people in, in the discussion earlier that I'm going to offer an apology to Greta Thunberg. And the reason I'm going to offer an apology is that Greta is going to have to go to the developing world and tell them that as a result of a desire to shut down coal mines, that they will have to forgo electricity. 
because the reality is that we still need to develop coal mines to deliver a fair and just energy transition. So that's why you see thermal coal. There's, 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 there's nothing in the bar there. That's because thermal coal demand will be the same in 2030 as it is now. Why is that? We've got a reduction in, in thermal coal demand in the, in the West and growth in the East. Why is it growing in the, east, in the East? Because it's cheap. It's cheap energy. They have plentiful supplies. So that's the unfortunate reality. It's the same with oil and gas. We can't build out this green economy and the use of metals without hydrocarbons. So again, we still need to invest in more oil and gas. It has to be as environmentally friendly as possible and as low carbon at the point of extraction as possible, but we still need it. So this is our base case thesis. Now, those of you who know a little bit about mining will know that you start off with a mine with a particular reserve base, and as you mine it, the reserve base depletes. So if we think about how, how, how and it's no different to, 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 uh, to, to an oil well, you start extracting the, the ore and the reserve base gets depleted. Also, what happens is over time, you start mining lower and lower grades. So you get less metal out per ton of, uh, of ore mined. So for, 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 for mine commodities, you are, you are always running against uh, the reduction in supply. If you, then, um, if you then marry that with the growth in demand, and you express that as a percentage of the market that is yet to be committed to, we have what we call a supply gap. The larger the percentage, the greater the supply gap. Call it a stress test for the industry. So if you've got a, uh, a, a, a supply gap of about 20% by 2030, that's telling you that in 2030, we can't identify where the supply is going to come from. That should be a, a strong positive for the mining sector because it represents an investment opportunity. So it's a reflection not only of demand growth, but it's also a reflection of supply decline. And you'll see, again, for some commodities, we're going to see a reduction in requirements. So you can see on the energy side, we've got a reduction in net requirement for oil. Now, in some later slides, I'll show you what the impact of a one and a half degree pathway is. And for those of you that are really into your oil analysis and thinking, if I was to tell you that by 2030, if we were to assume a one and a half degree pathway, the requirement for oil, crude oil, falls by 30%. Now, my energy cousins at Wood Mackenzie don't like me saying that, but that's the reality. We need to lose 30% uh, of oil supply compared to what we're predicting for 2030 under a one and a half degree um, pathway. For all the other mine commodities, to a greater or lesser degree, we are going to require significant investment. So all the area under this graph, for want of a better um, description, will require an investment of about $200 billion. And let's not forget that it takes anywhere between 8 and 15 years to develop a mine. And these gaps start to open up from about 2024, 2025. So what that tells you is we need to start, even if we were to invest now, we are unlikely to deliver the, the, the supply to meet requirements by 2030. And that's under a base case world. ETO. So that represents a fantastic opportunity in mining. So this is the positive spin, that with one or two exceptions, all these mined commodities are going to require substantial investment, and there's going to be substantial returns obtained because prices will be abnormally high. So that's our base case world, which is both alarming and also um, extremely positive in terms of mining investment. So what does it take to, 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 uh, to achieve accelerated decarbonisation, the one and a half degree pathway? Well, here I'll take you through what an AET pathway looks like. So this is Wood Mackenzie's construct. You'll see two lines and a, and, and, and a globe. The globe represents COP26 commitments or, or promises. And uh, I'm sure I'm not the first person to have said it, but COP26 was a cop out because there were a lot of pledges made, a lot of promises. We want to decarbonise, we want to eliminate X or Y, we want to build out a green economy. 
But unless and until that's enacted in policy, it matters not one jot. And so what we've done is we, we, we tried to work out what COP26 pledges would deliver if they were enacted. And, and we believe that they would deliver around about a two degree outcome. So to deliver a one and a half degree outcome, we need even more pledges, even faster, uh, and an even faster acceleration to deliver that one and a half degree world. Compare that to our base case. So we're gonna have to take out something like 25,000 million tons of carbon dioxide out of the economy, the global economy, to deliver that net zero. It's going to be an, a, a huge, huge challenge. So then I thought I'd show you, and it's quite busy, but, but really the takeaway, I just wanted to focus on renewables here, because you can see the trajectory under base case, which is the, the light blue uh, line, and then our AET one and a half pathway. It shows you the, the trajectory um, for different types of, 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 of fuel supply or energy supply. And you, and, 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 and you will see that wind and solar accelerate massively under an AET one and a half scenario. They increase under a base case scenario as well, I should add. And so by 2030, we need effectively to double the global wind capacity and solar capacity to, to help us get on that, that one and a half degree pathway. So the other thing to bear in mind is that uh, renewables are far more metals intensive. And I'll give you an example. To build a, a thermal power plant, whether that's gas turbine or coal, requires around two and a half tonnes of copper per megawatt of output or capacity. A wind farm or solar array will require something between 10 and 15 tonnes of copper per megawatt of capacity. So you've got a massive leveraging in terms of requirement. EVs. So last year, and one of my colleagues in the, in the audience will correct me if I'm wrong, I think we, 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 we sold six and a half million EVs last year. Under our base case um, trajectory for ETO, uh, we're looking at um, the market for EVs, or, or EVs representing 30% of the market, just about. If we, if we look at what, what that means in terms of um, the requirement for EV buy and build, translate it into a, a, an AET one and a half scenario, that almost needs to double. So we need for EVs to represent almost 60% of all sales of cars by 2030. In terms of the numbers, round numbers, by 2030 that means we need to be building and buying about 85 million EVs. And we did six and a half million last year. Bring it into 2024, 2025. So in three years time, that would mean we need to build and buy 45 million EVs. Rhetorical question, do you think that's plausible? I don't think it is. And so that, so it, it does represent a massive opportunity in terms of investment. But of course, the challenge here is that whilst car manufacturers can build the capacity for, to build EVs or assemble them, you've got an issue around the, um, the, the battery raw material supply chain. We've got to invest something like three, um, $350 billion in gigafactories. Politicians love gigafactories. North Vault, South Vault, East Vault, West Vault. Where's the raw materials going to come from? Because politicians and policymakers are great at stimulating demand, build a green grid, um, buy EVs and build EVs, build gigafactories. You say, well, okay, where's the metal going to come from? Are oh, we leave that to the market? I'll talk through some of the impediments uh, and opportunities later. So EVs become implausible in terms of delivering the number of EVs to green um, the, the uh, automotive transport. I, I mentioned the battery manufacturing capacity. Look at the difference between the, the manufacturing capacity that, that we need versus what we currently project. GM, I think, um, around about six weeks or two months ago, announced they're investing $7 billion in battery manufacturing capacity. $7 billion, fantastic. That still means we need another $350 billion. It's nowhere near enough. 
Does it mean we shouldn't try? Does it mean that there will not be a massive expansion of demand for mine commodities? Absolutely, it absolutely will. We will see a massive expansion in demand. It's just it won't be enough to deliver the one and a half degree pathway. That's the negative side of things. So I showed you the supply gaps under our base case scenario. And what I've done is I've said, well, okay, let's assume we are trying to deliver a one and a half degree scenario. And you'll see that these gaps explode for certain commodities. So the dark blue area is just the increase in the, in the requirement effectively. And so you'll see for certain commodities, we have an extreme demand pull. Patently, if you don't have supply, you can't have demand, so you end up with demand destruction. Even if we were to green light project development now, we will not be able to achieve this. What it means is that those actors and players that are investing now and are growing quite strongly into the energy transition will do very, very well, thank you. Shareholder returns are going to be spectacular. They're already spectacular. Mining companies do not know what to do with the cash. They're just handing it back to investors, which is great. But of course, at some point, there is a need to, to tilt the business towards growth. And you may have heard some of the major mining companies saying, this isn't about price. This is about, this is about some of the, the other impediments in terms of our ability to invest. Mining companies think they can convince institutional investors, pensions, et cetera, and their shareholders to invest, but there are other impediments. And I'll talk you through some of those impediments. So what are these impediments that constrain supply growth? So the whole ESG angle. Now, if I was to superimpose, and I haven't deliberately, because life is, is, is too short in terms of this presentation. If I was to superimpose where we are going to have to mine and process mined commodities for the energy transition, and I was to overlay it on this graph, or, or this map rather, you would see a very, very strong correlation between high ESG risk and where we are going to have to mine. That represents a massive challenge for the mining community, for investors, and indeed governments. So there needs to be partnerships between all three to enable mining to occur in places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, and in places where, where, where there is a, a risk around governance, around water stress, uh, around all, the, all, all the, the, the myriad bullet points here, um, we're going to have to get comfortable with risk. Now, obviously, you yourselves will know, with risk, you want reward. Right now, there is an ability to get reward, but without the risk. So there needs to be some sort of middle ground here if we are to deliver the energy transition. That only happens with partnerships. That only happens when governments enable mining companies to invest in places like the DRC with good governance, with the right ESG credentials, building things the right way. And also the, 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 the investor and financial community need to be on board. We're a world away from that at the moment. But that is what is necessary. For the companies that are able to do it right now, Again, they are going to achieve supernormal returns, similar to the returns that they are achieving as a result of the, 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 the Ukraine crisis. We also have market fundamentals, supply and demand dynamics. All I've done here is I've run across the whole mined commodity spectrum. And the takeaway is that with a likely global Western world slowdown as a result of the Ukraine-Russia um, war, let's call it a war it is, it's not special operations, it's a war. Um, we are likely to see demand slow slightly over the next couple of years. Despite energy transition, it won't be enough to offset, energy transition uses won't be enough to offset the slight slowdown. All the while, supply is growing. Why is it growing? Because it's incentivized to grow, because prices are high, margins are high, returns are high. And so it is likely that, that commodity markets will trend from deficit towards surplus. Mining companies and investors will say, hang on a minute, I'm not so sure about investing now when we're likely to see prices slightly lower than they are at the moment. I still want my dividend, please. Give me my dividend. I don't care about five or seven years time, I want it now because I've been burnt during the downturn in 2014, 15. So market fundamentals might not be supportive. Again, that becomes a problem when you're trying to put in place supply for 
five, seven, ten years hence. Because it just pushes the date point out by a couple of years. Margins. Our current margins, so these are 2021 margins. I, I could have shown you spot margins now, and they're even greater. Um, if I think about lithium, lithium spot margins are about 600% at the moment. Unsustainably high. These margins are abnormal for the industry. Uh, typically, um, at the processing level, and I'll take aluminium as an example, if you're running a smelter producing metal, you would expect a 10% pre-tax IRR. If you run a refinery next stage down the value chain, you'd expect 20%. If you're running a bauxite mine, you would expect 50%. So if you look at these margins, they are unsustainably high. Two things will happen. Either we will see inflation start to erode those margins, and we're starting to see that because of energy price inflation in particular, but also wage inflation. That is feeding through in terms of the, the cost structure of the industry. But also prices will start to be hit because the situation in Ukraine is likely to be abnormal. And we will see supply growth into these margins. Why would you not um, do fast track the supply that you can right now to achieve very, very strong margins? Why would you wait? So again, that, that plays into the thinking around whether we should invest. Again, this is, could do with updating, but for the first time ever, we have seen an increase in battery costs. Now, why does that matter? We all know, and I'd, I'd love to know how many people here either own an EV or intend owning an EV. Okay, one, two, not many, three, four, Small, a small proportion of people have an EV or intend buying one. Why? Because they're very, very expensive. Also, you get what's called range anxiety. You worry about the infrastructure. Now, quite why we need to have a 400-mile range on an EV when most petrol cars don't have a 400-mile range, the issue is infrastructure. Put the infrastructure in, in, in place, and with fast charging, you don't have that problem. But right now, the economics are, uh, are questionable in terms of if I buy a car, I'm not really interested in a five or six year payback. I don't want it to hit my pocket now, generally speaking. I might, I might wear one, years or, one year or two years. And at the moment, we've got battery costs going the wrong way. And if we think about a super cycle and rising prices, guess what? That means battery costs rise. Why are they rising um, faster than you might think? It's because the proportion of the battery made up by the raw materials is increasing because technology and scale reduce the manufacturing cost. So something like 70% of the cost of the battery is the raw material cost. So if prices are going up, guess what? Battery costs go up. They, will, they, they, they move up to a point where you start to look at alternatives alternative battery technologies, and we've started to see that. Ultimately, if you don't deliver economic supply, you get demand destruction. You might have heard of lithium-ion phosphate batteries. They apparently weren't good enough until Tesla decided that actually they are good enough. You know, only having a 0 to 60 acceleration of four seconds as opposed to two seconds is good enough. A range of 250 miles is good enough. And so what we're finding is that on cost grounds, there is a willingness and an ability to switch into alternatives. But that's an impediment on the, on, on the, on the massive explosion of, of EVs. Don't forget, 45 million by 2025, six and a half million last year. It's going to be a tough ask, but it represents an opportunity. Then last but not least, and this is all very, very detailed analysis, from, from my colleagues in the battery uh, raw materials team, we have to worry about China because I can see a situation in the not too distant future where we're going to be knocking on China's door saying, a bit like Tom Twist, please, sir, can we have some of your battery raw materials because we haven't got our own? And China will say, so you want us to give you some of our battery raw materials? so that you can deliver on your energy transition and you want us to forgo ours? The answer is no. So we go short of battery or materials. And if you think about, and, and, and the analogy I use is the, I call it the, the energy transition materials restaurant. So 
we in the West are sitting in the, in the taxi on the way to the restaurant, reading the menu. China is at the restaurant eating its dessert. China is securing its energy transition supply chain. It is investing in lithium, it's investing in copper and cobalt. Uh, and, and, and so it goes on. China owns 80% of the capacity at the battery manufacturing level, 80% or thereabouts of the precursor, 80% of the refining of these commodities. And even at the mine level, it's a bit misleading because if I look at cobalt from the DR, DRC, that's where it's located. China controls almost 50% of, of cobalt coming out of the DRC. You need cobalt at the moment for um, nickel manganese cobalt batteries. Um, if I think about nickel, again, you've got Indonesia, uh, uh, you've got Indonesia here. China is dominating nickel supply and supply growth in Indonesia. So if we are to deliver our energy transition, we want our investable Western companies to start investing in these commodities. At the moment, they're not investing fast enough. They have huge challenges. I mean, look at Rio Tinto with its JDAR project. It would love to develop homegrown supply in Europe. Lithium, it can't do it because we all become NIMBYs when it comes to building a mine in our own backyard or a processing facility. So in terms of the conclusions, because I've probably spoken for too long, so what a fantastic opportunity. For the first time in my career, we have multi-decade sight as to the direction of travel for the, mined, uh, for, for, for the mining industry, particularly around energy transition metals. And, 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 and we shouldn't think that energy transition just means lithium, cobalt, nickel. It means rare earths, it means aluminium, it means copper in particular. It even means zinc. You've got to galvanise all the steel that you've got to put in place for the, for the wind, uh, wind turbines. They need to be protected from the environment. So all these mined commodities are going to see explosive growth. There won't be enough to go around. So that the, the, the mining companies that are actually going to be producing these commodities are going to win out versus other investments. Thank you.